We're recording today on the lands of the Jagera people and acknowledge the traditional elders here, past, present and emerging. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm a digital marketer and small business owner. Hello, I'm Andrea. I'm a former registered nurse and midwife and a community advocate. Welcome to Beyond the Rona. We're on a journey here to talk to our community members and find out what the major issues are as we build back better um, and um, emerge from this pandemic. Yes, and today we're joined by Ben Stokes. So Ben is the founding partner at Chasing Rainbows, which is an early stage investment fund specifically aimed at creating equality in the investment space. And so the fund makes uh, investments in founders who come from underrepresented backgrounds in tech. So specifically kind of talking about um, founding teams uh, consisting of women, of people of culture and uh, LGBTQ plus communities. So uh, Ben's also the uh, advisor and mentor at Austrade's landing pad in San Francisco. And actually like back in 2016, uh, I had the pleasure of, of visiting uh, that space. Um, and he was uh, the CEO and founder at Social Table, which was also based in San Francisco. And he's also had roles at uh, Lever, Salesforce and Oracle. Um, but in fact, his career started in the medical uh, sales field. So Ben, what actually got you into tech in the first place? Yeah, I guess like it's 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 been an interesting journey, I suppose you could say. Um, I, you know, I started my career like in the medical field itself, and then from there decided to move across when I realised that medicine wasn't really for me um, into sort of more tech, um, and and slowly started moving myself out of that. So I started like in medical device sales, so that's where I sort of started to initially move out of the actual clinical work, and then from that. Uh, moved across and got my first job at Oracle and then obviously Salesforce as well, where I was really focusing on, on tech and the healthcare sector. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, and okay. these days uh, with Chasing Rainbows, um, can you tell us a bit about yeah how that came about and, and, and its mission? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the biggest challenges uh, as an underrepresented founder is is trying to get access to capital. And, and what I noticed, you know, during my time as a founder myself was that you know, it it really does depend on who you know as to what you know what sort of capital you can raise, particularly in those early stages of your of your fund and um, of raising your sorry uh, funding for your startup. One one of the big challenges is that you know if you don't have a great network, it's really hard to sort of do that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I started chasing rainbow simply because what I realized is that underrepresented founders in particular have a lot less access to capital. So uh, I don't know if you know much about the stats, but you know, less than less than 1% of companies who are raising, um, oh, so one, sorry, less than 1% of companies actually raise any capital towards their startup. Of that 1%, less than 15% are from underrepresented wow. founders. Now that includes all underrepresented founders. So that's women, Black, Brown, Latinx, LGBTQ+, et cetera. And so when yeah. you start breaking those numbers down even further, you start realizing this access to capital is, is almost impossible for a lot of these founders to actually start raising. Um, and so, so I hang on, it, can I just, uh, yeah. can I just, sorry to interrupt you, but just to make it easy for people in Logan to understand. So you're, so a founder is a person who wants to start a business. Yeah. Okay. And your capital, what would you use capital for? Capital is, is used for, like, I guess, growing your business. So like that's employing staff. It's about uh, using for advertising and, and getting your brand out there. It's about building a product or a platform that you're building online. Okay. As well. So using it to build the technology. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. Sorry. No, 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 that's all good. And so I guess like what I, what I realized is that, you know, particularly when, you know, founders are underrepresented, they don't have the opportunity to raise much from their friends and family, which means that they're always going to be behind the eight ball when they're trying to um, trying to compete, I guess, as a new company. And so my goal as a fund manager is to ensure that those uh, those founders get access to that capital early on so that they can move their idea from idea actually into a business that's operating and then generating revenue as well. And what is so I, I... Uh, you were mentioning that you kind of like the the playing field is changing and there's there's kind of like more activity in this space but yeah can you shed some light on what what's actually happening currently 
Yeah, I, I guess like you know when you start thinking about that, like I specialize in investing in under in like LGBTQ plus founders specifically, and what I've noticed within that space is that a number of LGBTQ plus founders, when they come out, they lose their friends and family, sadly, um, who don't accept them, and so yeah. what that means then is that they have less people to actually raise from, and right. so the fund is specifically built to be that friends and family for these founders in that early stage. Right. Um, yeah, and I think I think the, the the big thing is is that you know when you're when you're a founder, raising capital, particularly in those early stages, allows you to not have to work two or three jobs trying to make ends meet, as well as trying mm-hmm. to do your company as well. What it allows you to do is take a step back, have some money in the bank to actually then focus on actually building out a real business plan and a real strategy, and also a real product that actually is in market that you can actually then start you know using and people can start using it and hopefully purchasing as well that's awesome okay and in the future like where where do you see um chasing rainbows going like kind of like what's what's the kind of 10-year horizon look like yeah so so our goal is that as a fund we started as a rolling fund on angel list and so the idea behind rolling funds is that you can start deploying capital into startups a lot sooner than a traditional fund. So a traditional fund works in the way that you have to raise an entirety of the fund first before you can start giving it out to startups to start building on their own businesses. Um, Those investments usually last around seven to 10 years. And so with a rolling fund, it's similar, but we're we're, we're able to start deploying (laughs) capital a little bit earlier because um, because of the way the structure works against the SEC based in the states, yeah. Ah, and and yeah, sorry. No, no, please. Yeah, no, I was uh, just going to say uh, it's just a different way of, of looking at a structure for fundraising. Yeah. And so, yeah, with the pandemic, and I, I think this is a an interesting um, period because certainly, like a lot of people who say, for example, been employed, then lost their jobs. Um, and some have then thought, right, I'm going to start my own thing. Right. Um, when, when you've got so many people potentially kind of entering that, that, that kind of startup journey, um, and, and beginning a new business, um, have you seen any kind of big shifts, uh, or I guess what has changed, um, you know, since 2020 to, to now? Well, I guess the big thing is, is is thinking about how now people are working remotely so much more office space is not being mm-hmm. used the way that it was used before, which means that people have had to be, I guess, a little bit more creative in the ways that they, they work together and they build teams together and they start, you know, like building things out together as well. Like, you know, like I, with Social Table, what I was doing with that company, we were, um, we were actually helping uh, companies keep their company culture alive through social networking for their companies because one of the challenges today with zoom for example is that you know you go from zoom meeting to zoom meeting to zoom meeting every single zoom meeting has an agenda and so you don't have time to be social anymore with your colleagues yeah Uh, you're always like problem solving on it or working on particular things in in the zoom meeting that you're that you're with and so one of the challenges with that is that you lose that element of what makes your company special, which is that culture that, you know, that we all love about, you know, that water cooler talk or going, grabbing beers with, with colleagues and just getting to know each other and that sort of thing. Yeah. And so, so I guess like today, what the biggest change is that people have had to be creative in how they, how they keep those relationships alive at the same time. It's what, what this has meant is that people are now able to use technology that was always there. Like Zoom has been around for many years, mm. but use it in a way that now makes more sense for them. So, you know, most teams, for example, are working remotely. People aren't going to a singular office. They're working from home, which means that, you know, we're using te- the technology the way that it was supposed to be used. So what that means now for new startup founders, um, in particular new companies that are being created, is that they're able to use these new ideas around technology in new ways that enable them to, to be more uh, creative, I guess you would say. Yeah. yeah. And what kind of businesses are actually using, you know, like this kind of service, you know, your like what kind of businesses do you come across? Um, so in terms of like when with, with social table, what I, what I found yeah. was that we had all sorts of companies using us. So we had tech startups, we had, uh, banking services. We even actually did a, did an event with the UN general assembly. So oh. it's been, 
really interesting to see lots of different types of people use use the platform. Um, you know, when I started Social Table, I started here in Australia, actually. So right. I started in Sydney and I built it up, you know, initially that we were in the US, Europe and Australia. And then when the pandemic hit, we, we took it all virtual. So we were using Zoom and, and other things like that. And we were sending wine, beer, spirits and tea directly to people's houses. Mm -hmm. And so what what that meant is that people then could actually connect with their colleagues in that new way, but do it over Zoom, but still have this shared experience. So we also included a LA or like a like somebody talked people through that oh, yeah. wine tasting that they received. What um, what I was able to do then through the pandemic was actually expand Social Table to be in Africa, in South America, in Asia as well. We even had an astronaut call in one time. So like quite global and out of this world, really. <laughs> yeah. um, and so when I start looking at that, it's, again, it just shows you that technology enables us to, to do things that we didn't think possible before. Yeah, that would be good. But then apparently um, there's about 30% of Australians, according to the Australian Digital Inclusion Index, they've done that, like this massive survey um, across Australia and they found about like almost 30% of Australians don't have really good um, access to the internet. Um, I don't know, like what have you found across Australia with um, access to the internet? Have you found any problems there with people yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And I think that, you know, one of the challenges that coronavirus oh, has really taught us is that, you know, internet, how important internet is, particularly for kids, right? So with education and you yeah. know, kids, not, kids not being able to be educated because they can't go to school and, yeah. they can't, and then obviously needing the internet to be able to be part of their classes. And I think that's one thing that, that's been super interesting to see is like how we've been able to overcome that. I know that you know, for example, I think the good guys uh, are doing a, a drive for parents who can't afford um, you right. know, technolo technology to enable them to actually be yeah. able to oh, afford right. it for their kids to be able to, to learn. And so, uh, you know, I think that there's an, definitely grants and, and things like that which actually help with this. But I, from a technology standpoint, that's a hard one, right? It's like how do you, yeah. you know, from an infrastructure Maybe. standpoint, you can't do much yeah. about it if you can't, if you can't access Um so I think I think one good thing to come out of out of the whole COVID situation is the fact that te that you know there has been an incentive for the government to actually ensure that people yeah, do have access. Yeah, we need to move to that, don't we? Yeah. yeah. The other big one is um, digital health. That mm -hmm. um, you know our governments are realizing that digital health is is needed. Um, yeah. But then again, they've surveyed people and found that there's about 20% of people who are a bit nervous about putting their information online and sharing their private information online. Yeah. Um, but that would be really good if we could grab those people and, um, you know, maybe people could start up their own businesses. I know, for example, like I'm a midwife by, yeah. you know, my previous job. Um, so say if I wanted to start up my own midwifery business, you know, private practice, um, they're screaming out for private practice midwives out in regional areas, for example, rural areas, you know, that's a place where people want home births and, um, the, you know, that's a place where we need private practice midwives. There's a yeah. new um, uh, policy coming out for um, increasing um, nurse practitioners, for example, yeah. where nurses can prescribe um, you know, because there's not as many GPs out in rural areas. So these kind of, um, you know, even digital health for psychology, um, yep. you know, where you can do these sorts of things. Yeah. So it'd be really good if we could get these people to start up their own businesses. So I don't know if you could get founders to help, I don't know, like, I mean, sorry, investors to help start these businesses. Yeah. Interestingly enough, actually, I had a conversation with a potential startup to invest in the other day that is in the health space, but they're looking at VR. And so using mm -hmm. VR for an education What's VR, tool, sorry? Uh, so virtual reality as okay. a way of using that to sort of educate um, people and, uh, uh, you know, particularly young surgeons in, in, you know, how to do procedures. And, you know, like obviously with, since, the, uh, since the COVID situation has happened, telehealth has become a much bigger thing. And I don't know if, yeah. if you know, like many Australians realise this, but all Australian health data has to be held onshore. 
So I was actually yeah. part of the team at Oracle mm. that wrote that into the constitution with the PCEHR, which is the personally wow. controlled electronic health record. And so when you start looking at that side of things, you realize that the that the information that you are giving is only staying on Australian shores and only, right. you know, so it's not being accessed outside. And that's a really important fact from a safety and privacy standpoint to, to sort of recognize. Um, and it's written into our constitution that that's where it has to stay. Um, wow. And, and wow. so when you start looking at those sort of things, it does sort of, you know, make that a little bit less of a um, concern. And I guess now with telehealth being, you know, particularly for a number of people, even during COVID, right, you couldn't go to the GP if you have COVID. So you had mm. to do a you had to do a tele telehealth appointment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you're realizing that the difference between seeing a doctor using telehealth or seeing them in person is not, not really that different because they're writing the notes on the same platform. It's sitting in the same system, all of those sort of things. It's just whether or not you're on the phone or if they're seeing them in person. Um, and, yeah. you know, doctors are able to prescribe, um, you know, based off, you know, talking to you. The other thing is that the video calls as well has, has enabled that, uh, if, you know, yeah. with, with emergency services. Uh, with midwives and, 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 you know, emergency health care. Um, yeah, it's only really if you needed, like, hands-on, like, examination. Yeah. Then you need an in-person um, yes. appointment. But, yeah, it would be really good if we could get, you know, healthcare providers who can work independently, if they can set up their own business and, you know, somehow get funding to set up their own business to to do this sort of thing out rural, regional areas. I mean, that's... It's hard to set up your own business as your, as your own practitioner. Like it's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's really hard. And I think that any, any business owner can, can, can relate to that. It is hard. Um, but yeah. what it takes is it takes that grit and it takes that determination and it takes that, uh, that, that, that conviction as well. And I think that's one of the big things that I look for when I invest in companies, right, is I look for – I always ask every single founder I invest in, why did you start your company? Mm. Because, you know, when you've had a really tough day at the office, the only thing that's going to get you back there tomorrow is because you're, de you're solving a problem that's re that you're really passionate about solving. And so that's your why. Like, that's the why you get out of bed every day. And so being able to articulate that and being able to be really passionate about that is really important as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Um, on as well, kind of like on that point about starting businesses, um, I was interested in your take on this um, policy announcement. So uh, Larissa Waters, who's a, a Green Senator, launched a policy last month, um, which was a $10 million um, fund microfinancing uh, low and, and no interest loans to women led business specifically in, in regional areas. Um, I'm just interested in, yeah, your take on this from your side. And I guess also like, what what where do you see the role of government in addressing this as well yeah absolutely i think one of the biggest challenges in australia is that you know we are remote in so many ways like there's so mm. many people in remote areas and i grew up on one right so i grew up on the northwest coast of tasmania which is there's three thousand people in my town right. it's tiny and so so i get what it's like to be remote and and, and so when i start thinking about that I start thinking about, okay, well, how, how do people build businesses and how do people build ideas and, and that sort of thing in those areas? And one thing that, to note is that a lot of those ideas are specific to their own communities too. And I like that because it means that people stay in their communities and they actually help the communities thrive and get better mm. and be stronger. And, and so that's one thing that I always sort of like want to remember is like, okay, well, using, you know, with this, new initiative, then like being able to lean into those things is really important. So, you know, if you're, if you're a woman business leader in that space who wants to create a business and has a great idea that's going to help their community, then absolutely look at, look at that funding and sort of build out your business idea and actually build out the business plan as well. And I think one thing the government has been really good at is actually helping people in those rural um, areas to actually come up with ideas and also business planning tools to actually ensure that they have created a business that is sustainable as well. And so you get free mentorship and you get other, other things like that. I know in New South Wales, for example, there is a, um, a mentorship program for women in particularly who are out 
outside of um, outside of the city areas to actually be able to get a mentor that they jump on a Zoom call with mm. and actually talk to them. And so I think that those, that sort of thing is really important as well. It's like building in a little bit of that structure as well. And that sense of like local, like, you know, hyper local um, founders who are in their communities and the benefit, I guess, of them building companies that don't have to be based in a, in a capital city or, you know, they don't have to kind of leave Australia potentially. I mean, there was always this thing yeah. when I, when I started my business, you would know this very well, Ben, it's like, you've got to get out of Australia. There was this sense of yeah. like, you know, right. a decade ago, it was like, if you're starting a business, like go to San Francisco, go to Silicon Valley, um, which is great. Absolutely. But how has that, you know, there's this feeling that yeah. that's really changed, but how do you see that at the moment? Well, no, no, it's really interesting you bring that up because um, I, I work with um, some people out of Oakland in San Francisco, like just out of San Francisco, who right. actually are talking about community and actually community development. And community development is, is an interesting thing, right? Because, you know, like from a location perspective, your community is where you are. But from a global perspective now, with the use of technology, we're able to create a community, our community, or find our community wherever we want. Um, and so, like, it's interesting to see how the, that that version or our our idea of community has changed. One thing that that they really spoke about, though, is this whole microfinancing within local communities, which I think is what you're alluding to here, which is really interesting. And so, so what they were um, what they sort of were discussing with me was around how you know in, in you know in our grandparents or parents at age like thinking about you know like everybody lived in their one community you know you had one doctor one banker one accountant one financial advisor one tax person like and so everybody went to each person within that community or within their own community what that meant was that those people then would spend their money back in the community back at the local shops back at the uh, and so what that meant was that that community helped the community sustain and kept growing because of that like the, it's almost like a transfer of the finance around, if that makes sense. Yes. And so similarly, like that's how communities are working these days at larger size than that. Um, but like, you know, from a more you know, remote standpoint, um, you know, and again, like, you know, what I fund in the LGBT community is a perfect example of that. Um, to go to go back to what you were saying, though, around people leaving Australia, I had that same experience, right? And I think that, you know, like many of us have, and I think Melanie Perkins from Canva said the same thing, right? You know, yeah. like her advice was always being told to leave Australia and go and, and then come. And, but she, you know, she came back. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, like for me, it was, it was really interesting. Australia is a perfect place to test out, is a, uh, out your ideas, particularly if you do have that global, um, I guess, vision for your company. And the reason why is because Australia is a remote sort of community in a sense, and you can get things off the ground here. If it's going to work, it's going to work. If it's, if it's going to work anywhere, or work, it, you know, it's going to definitely have to work here. And so um, I think that was something I, I learned very early on, getting the idea up and running here to be able to take it overseas. And that was, Australia was a perfect testing ground for that. Yeah. I would have thought like kind of traditional women's businesses would have been more kind of service related, um, you know, like, uh, I suppose starting up their own beautician therapies or I don't know, a physiotherapy business or a, um, psychology business or a, you know, like I said before, a midwifery business, do you know what I mean? A cleaning business, like traditional kind of women stuff, you know, but do you find that there's a lot of women who are starting up in the tech industry? Like yeah, absolutely. And you know, like my, my first thing is don't limit don't limit yourself as a woman, right? You are, yeah. you are, I can, I can guarantee you, I you are think. much smarter and much, much more capable than any man who's sitting in this room, right? So I agree. I just want to point that out. Um, and then all, like, you know, secondly, like, you know, like one thing that I really love about all the women founders I've invested in, I've invested in a number of them is that they know who they are when they walk in the room and, you know, like, I think that that's one of the things that I'm really proud of the of the women I've invested in is is they don't they don't take it from people who, you know men who often you know 
uh, downplaying them in any way. Like these women are strong women and they know what they're going after and they mm -hmm. are in tech. And, you know, they, they, I think one thing about underrepresented founders and women in particular is that you have to work twice as hard for half the respect a lot of men get almost given to them straight away. But mm -hmm. I like to finish that statement with the best thing about that is that they go twice as far. And I want you to remember wow. that. And they do. Like, you know, my yeah. iPad, I, I had a company that I invested in that exited, I was very lucky, seven weeks after I invested in them. Yeah. Um, and that was women-led. And yeah. uh, Kelly, the founder, is, is one of the most amazing founders I've ever met. She is so committed and so strong. And, and you know, like she doesn't take any you know, crap from anybody. She really gets in there and makes sure that, you know, that she's heard. And she has done extremely well. And other, other women that I've invested in, my very first investment was a, a, also a woman founder as well. And she has done some awesome things. She built her company up from nothing to be a $10 million AR a year business, right? Wow. And AR God, that's amazing. Yeah. $10 million in annual revenue per year. And I look at that and just go, like, you know, as a guy, would I have been able to do the same thing? I can tell you I wouldn't have been able to. Like that, she was very driven and she knew what she wanted to do. So don't ever underestimate women who, who in any way. Wow. Yeah, Andrea. Yeah, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> sorry. It, yeah, it's such a good point. I mean, it's such a and and you know, in 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 my experience as well, you know, um, being around a lot of um, founders, especially in these co-working spaces where you're in a shared office space, there's all these other founders, and you're just looking around the room, going. There's a real gender imbalance uh, going on mm -hmm. here, and but then when you meet um, a, a female founder, um, I totally agree with what you're saying, Ben. Like they are so driven and very, very clear about you know their direction, what they want for their business, what they want to build, and they really stick out. Like I think that they're they're very um, inspirational um, to a lot of male founders who. Yeah, I, I think um, there's, you know, certain kind of demographic groups, um, you know, that you could probably pinpoint like typical personas, I guess, of, of male founders. But yeah, um, the female founders that are also emerging that I'm, I'm uh, through River City Labs. So this is the Brisbane based uh, co-working space. And they also have a lot of programs and education for, for new new founders. Um, yeah, the new, the new female founders coming through the RCLs program at the moment are, are pretty amazing. So yeah, I, yeah, I totally I agree, agree with that. that. Um, and you've just, so you're on the sunny coast right now, Ben, but you, you've come back <clears throat> to, am, yeah. and, and you came to Brisbane, which is where, where we met initially in Brisbane. What do you feel about Brisbane today? Like what do you, have you seen any kind of big change in the city itself? Yeah. Is it a place that a founder can really thrive? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just mentioned River City Labs, right? And I, I was very fortunate mm. enough to be at, at one of your demo days in a sense. And like listening to the founders there, there are some amazing ideas coming out of Brisbane and they are smart and they are, you know, I, I, I was just like, I was actually quite blown away by the, the, the caliber of the companies that I, and the founders that I met, which was really cool. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate. I've been, you know, I've been able to do this, you know, this sort of mentorship thing across the globe. Like I've got, I meant, I've got a mentee based in Spain. I've got one based in the U S and I've been part of the, um, Austrade as well, like with the landing pad and, you know, like I, I've met good founders and stuff like that, but the quality of the ones coming out of Brisbane were, if not better than some of the ones I've met before. Right. And so I want people to realize that just because you're from Queensland doesn't mean anything. You can you know, <laughs> go over the world. Right. I mean, I'm a boy yeah. from Tassie, right? And I had the opportunity to speak at the just UN. Just because we're cowboys. So, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, I just, I just want to point that out. Like, yeah. there's some really, really awesome startups. And I think, I think that's the thing. Like, you know, like when you, the only person that's going to limit you is yourself. And so I think that that's yeah. the other thing that you have to remember as a founder is that don't, don't, don't let yourself hold you, hold you back. Like, go out there and do the things that you, that you dream. Cause Hey, we've only got one life. We may as well go out and do, make it our own. Right. Yeah. That's so inspiring. Ex 
Excellent. One one other point, I guess, uh, Ben, on that is, you know, we're talking about successful stories. You mentioned Mel from Canva. Um, yeah. Abs- to- total legend. You know, I think in, in the in the Aussie startup kind of folklore, you know, Canva, Atlassian, um, the the one shout out um, to Logan. So I, because, you know, Andrea and I grew up in, in Logan and, and certainly this this podcast is all based around you know, that basically like the suburban heartland of Brisbane, um, go yeah. one is a great kind of Logan tech company, but then, um, you know, I mean, there are a lot of other fantastic Logan based businesses, but in terms of tech, that's kind of born and bred in Logan. Yeah. Go one is probably like, you know, one of the few that's kind of shot up, um, recently, but do you see that, that sense of kind of, um, success, success stories like that being um, the motivation factor, like how much is that playing into new founders these days? Well, I, I think the, the really interesting thing, as we mentioned earlier, is the fact that technology today means that we can be anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter where you are. And I think that that's really important to remember. Um, you know, like the last three unicorns, I think, that were founded were actually founded out of um, out of Africa, right? And so you start looking at some of these some of these things and you start thinking, well, actually you can be located anywhere. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Mm. And just, you know, Logan is no different, right? You've got internet access, you've got a computer, what's stopping you? And so I think that that's the big thing. Like, you know, I think one thing that, that I like to really, really bring home here is that it's not a lack of, of education and it's not a lack of intellect that stops us. It's a lack of opportunity, Right. right? And so if that lack of opportunity is the only thing that's stopping us, it's not intellect and it's not anything else, then we have to go out and get that opportunity and make that opportunity happen. So we have to take every single chance we have and, and give it a go. And so, you know, that's the whole point here is that, you know, like, though, you know, as you mentioned, Go One and, and a few of the others, like, you know, here, out of coming out of Australia, like we've all had, you know, that opportunity to, to sort of, you know, it wasn't our intellect that's holding us back because we are, we're, we're smart people. It's just opportunity. So if, you know, any opportunity that you get to, to sort of do things or, and then I'd say, give it a go. And, yeah. and, you know, the resources that are available to us today because of the internet <coughs> as well means that you, you can get educated. Like I just, I, I got my MBA and I just finished a course at UC Berkeley and I did that all remote from here. So there's no awesome. reason why yeah. I can't, you know, there's no reason why anybody can't do the same thing. That's great. Yeah. No, really, really good, good motivation for the, for those that, yeah, thinking about making that, that first step, right. You can do it. It's, hmm. it's just a matter yeah. of, um, taking that first step ultimately. Yeah. And then also like, it's not, and I, I will say this definitely, it's not easy. Like, you know, it takes a lot of, it takes time and it takes, hmm. it takes a lot of, um, investment in yourself to be yes. able to do it as well. But if you are committed, then you will. And again, this goes back to what I was mentioning before about your why. If your why is to create a company and you know that you've got to get the, you know, you've got to do some courses to get there, then you will do those courses and you'll make that happen. So, yeah. Yeah. I think I'd have to add to that, that we need government policy to kind of surround us with mm-hmm. that support as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, say we might need, for example, I represent the disability community. So we need that government support in the disabled space, say, for example, NDIS policy, um, you know, to support that community. Um, Absolutely. You know, the infrastructure for Internet. Do you know what I mean? Like we need that government policy to, to surround that, to make that happen. And, and again, I think that the, the whole COVID situation has really taught us about that and about those needs and, and to see that it's allowed us to analyze and see the gaps as well. So, you know, yeah. you mentioned that the 30% earlier, I'm curious to see if that's still 30% two years later to, to sort of understand mm. yes. where that is, where that's. Yeah. 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 Good point. Well, Ben, this has been great. Um, before we l- let you go, uh, we always ask our guests for their three big ideas. Um, and to bring this back to Chasing Rainbows, you know, to, to three big ideas for kind of leveling the playing field for those underrepresented founders. I mean, we, you've touched on some of these points already in our conversation, but what would be your big three? 
Yeah, I, I think the the big three for me is always just the only way you can you can sort of level that playing field is by making equitable investments. So you have to really be sure about where you're investing to ensure that the playing field is becoming level. That's number one. Number two is around the opportunities, like giving everybody an opportunity to be able to level that playing field as well. So, And then the third thing is around uh, representation. I think representation mm-hmm. is so important. Like if, if you are a young person trying to go for a job and, you know, you see nobody in the management who mm. looks like you, it's really hard for you yeah. to know that, you know, you go to that office and your needs are going to be met based off that. And so it's really important for companies to have that representation and have people, you know, feeling like they they themselves are being represented within the company management structure um, and then having opportunities to be able to do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Excellent. yeah, thank you so much. Thanks so much for your time, Ben. It's been a really great chat. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no. thanks, Ben. And no, thanks. It's an honor to be part of it. Yeah, that's fantastic. And thanks, Andrea. Good to chat. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Good to <laughs> chat to you today. Um, you've been listening to uh, Beyond the Verona. Uh, Caption audio is available on our YouTube channel. Uh, and don't forget, you can also visit uh, beyondtherona.com. You can see full transcripts and listen to previous episodes. And please do get in touch if you're interested in any of the topics that we've talked about. Catch you next time.